This morning, if you have your Bibles, find with me James chapter 3, in the book of James. If you're starting back in Revelation, you go forward there to Jude and the letters of John, Peter, and then you find James, James chapter 3. We're talking about the subject that's in everybody's mouth, the tongue, and particularly the trouble with the tongue. The power of the tongue is disproportionate to its size. It is a two-ounce muscle that is capable of more destruction than a 2,000-pound missile. And here in James chapter 3, we're going to be looking at the subject of the tongue. And you know, last week we talked about the relationship between faith and works. This morning we're going to see that our words are our works, are part of our works. And uh, our words say a lot about our spiritual life. They're the barometer, the indicator of our spiritual health. So I want you to listen to what James says in chapter 3 and verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in a word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth both fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. The pastor was preaching on this passage one time, and after he gave the invitation, a lady came forward, and she said, Pastor, I'd like to lay my tongue on the altar. And the pastor said, that would be wonderful, but unfortunately, our altar is only 20 feet long. I hope that you'll have the opportunity to get a little bit of a laugh in this morning because, as you can probably tell from what we've just read, the rest of the message will not be an easy one. This is not an amen sermon, it's an oh me sermon. And I realize that in the book of James, it steps on our toes. He steps on our toes quite a bit. And he's been stepping on my toes in the study before he uh, steps on your toes in the sanctuary. But as we think about what he says here, it's important to recognize that, that while this hurts a little bit, it's kind of like a shot. That shot that you get at the doctor, it, it might, uh, it, there might be a sting, but uh, the medicine will have its effect to do what it needs to do. In the Word of God, it may hurt a bit, but it is helpful to us to grow in holiness. And as we think about what James tells us here about the trouble with the tongue, he begins by showing us the impact of the tongue. The words have a tremendous influence and impact on our lives and on the world in which we live. The book of Proverbs says it like this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And this same principle is laid out very clearly in the epistle, in the letter of James. Notice here in uh, the first few verses, he shows us the impact of the tongue. And he shows us the impact of the tongue on a number of different facets and areas of our human life. The first way that he shows that it affects our life is on the discipline in our life. He says, my brethren, let not many of you become 
teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Now, he gives a warning right out of the gate that's a little troubling to us about he warns us against becoming preachers. He warns us against becoming a life group or Sunday school teachers. And uh, as he does so, he includes himself in the group. He says we. He, he recognizes that he also is a teacher. He says Let not many of us become teachers, knowing that we, he says, we shall receive a stricter judgment. And I think what he's saying there is very clearly that if you want to teach, if you want to have some level of spiritual responsibility for studying the Word of God and teaching it to others, then you need to recognize a few things that you, you don't necessarily want to do this for recognition's sake. There are some people who want to be Sunday school teachers, who want to be life group leaders, who want to be pastors because they want recognition without responsibility. And that's always a very dangerous thing. I heard about a little boy one time who was walking with his dad through the church. And he pointed to the pulpit and he said, Daddy, I want to be a preacher. He said, Dad said, Son, why do you want to be a preacher? He said, So I can stand up there and tell people what to do. Now, there's a lot of people, I think, who look at ministry like that. They want to tell somebody else what to do. But James says that there's a great responsibility for those who teach. And he says, why should you evaluate and think twice before becoming a teacher or a preacher? He said, number one, because, you know, we're going to have the stricter judgment. And that involves greater personal responsibility. With greater knowledge comes greater responsibility. Uh, the Bible says it like this when Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So the more that you study, uh, the more that you know, the more you're required to do. Many of you who have taught before you realize this is that you can learn a lot from being a student, but you learn even more being a teacher. Because when you have to study something to the point where you grasp it and you get it enough that you can teach it to others, you know the material very well. And the more that you study the Bible, the better you know the Bible, and then the more responsibility you have at a personal level to obey the Bible. And not only does it come with greater personal responsibility, it also comes with greater responsibility for others. You understand that uh, whenever you teach the Word of God to people, if you do not get it right, if you mislead others, then you yourself will be subject to judgment. I'll be judged in a stricter way than, uh, than, than, than others in this room today because I, I, if, I, if I don't proclaim the truth of God to you, then God will hold me responsible for that. I believe it's also just true that the more that we speak, and the more that we know, uh, we just have the more opportunity to sin. Even in the life of the church, the more that you know about people, uh, the more that you spend time talking to people, the more opportunities you have to sin. For example, the Bible says in where, where uh, many words are, sin is not lacking. But as we think about that, this isn't just to teachers. This is not just written to discourage you from becoming a pastor or a life group leader. This is written for all believers because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, but I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Does that mean that you, are, you will go to hell for the words that you say? No, he's talking to believers here. He says, my brethren, remember? He says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we'll receive a stricter judgment. He's not saying that you're going to go to hell for your words. This is not about whether or not you'll be redeemed. It's whether or not you'll lose your reward. I believe there will be many people who will stand before the judgment seat of Christ as believers. They're going to go into heaven. But they will have a, a moment of shame at the judgment because they will re recognize that rather than building people up with their words, they broke them down with their words. And, and this is very common. We can see uh, how often people begin to tear others down and don't think about how their words are affecting others. So we don't want to do anything that would cause others to, to fall or to be uh, taken down spiritually. But verse 2 says, for we all stumble in many things. And by the way, I just encourage you to all of, all of us need to recognize that, that we, all, we all struggle in this area. 
I was thinking about a couple of areas in my life where I just seemed to really uh, fall short of God's glory on a regular basis. And I think this is just one of those areas in my life. I say, yeah, I look at it and I think and see that this isn't, I'm not, I'm not obedient in this area like I need to be. And the Lord needs to help me to grow in this area. Well, he says, for we all stumble in many ways. And we are stumbling people and we especially stumble with our words. And he says, in fact, that if you never sin in this area, that you're a perfect person. And so nothing is opened uh, by mistake more often than the mouth. Just think about this. If the fish had kept his mouth closed, it had never been caught. But if we look at our lives, we can see that the output of our mouth originates in our hearts. And so it affects the way that we are disciplined, but it also affects not only the discipline in our life, but it also impacts the direction of our life. Notice there in verses 3 to 5 there, he talks about we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. He also looks at the illustration of a ship, and he talks about the rudder of the ship and how it directs the entire vessel. And these illustrations show us the impact of the tongue to direct our lives and to direct our outcomes and to direct our futures. I just think about that analogy and the illustration of guiding a horse. A horse, I, I'm told, an average horse weighs between 600 to 1,000 pounds, depending on the kind of horse it is and the size of the horse. But some of you watched the Kentucky Derby and you saw Rich Strike, that very large, powerful horse, and uh, seated on his back and all the other horses that were there was were these jockeys. And, I, you know, most of jockeys, and I don't mean anything by this, but they're just not very big people. I, I, I would enjoy hanging out with a bunch of them because I'd be the tallest man in the room. They're just not large, large people. I mean, they're kind of the uh, type that uh, is a guy in Kentucky used to tell me about, uh, about my wife when we first got married. He said, you know, she'd have to run around the shower to get wet. She could tread water in a test tube. That's the way most of those jockeys are. They're not very big people. But here is this man uh, who's, who, who doesn't weigh a whole lot. He's sitting on the back of this horse, and he can direct that entire beast with a bit and a bridle. And, and yet, in the same way, we think about our lives, and, and if a, a, a beast of burden can be directed with a bit and a bridle, why can we not seem to direct our lives at our mouths in, in the same way? And, and in the same way, we need to see that our lives should be bridled by the Bible. Our lives should be placed under the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not only our life, but also our lips. And they, they should be directed towards God, but we can't seem to do that. And not only does he look at the illustration of the bit and the bridle, but also he thinks, uh, he says, look at the rudder of a ship. Now, even so, the tongue, a little member, boasts great things. If you don't see the, empower, the important impact of the tongue to influence the entire direction of your life and the life of a nation, then just think about what he's saying here. Think about how the tongue has influenced human history. Two men that stand out to me are Winston Churchill and Adolf Hitler. <clears throat> no matter what we want to think, both of these men had incredible power with their, with their words. But one man, Churchill, used his words, used his tongue to defend his nation. And the other man used his tongue to destroy his nation. <clears throat> and so we think about that. And uh, <clears throat> we're, I'm told that for every word of Hitler's Mein Kampf, that, Mein Kampf, that there were uh, 125 lives lost during World War II. So we think about the power of the tongue. But not only is there the great power in the tongue, but, but think about how a word could influence your personal life. With a word guilty or not guilty, a person's life will either be restrained in prison or released from prison. With the word yes or no, a young lady's life can be changed in response to that question, will you marry me? Words have incredible power in our lives to direct our future like a bit and a bridle, like the rudder of a ship. And therefore, we ought to make sure that our words are directing our lives and the lives of others closer to the Lord. As Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to your hearers. Words impact the way that we are disciplined in our lives, that it may influence the way uh, our lives are directed and the direction of our lives, but also our words impact 
the destruction in our lives and in the lives of others. Notice verse, verse 5. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And seemingly unimportant or insignificant conversation or word can have incredible disaster and destruction as a result. Some of you remember the advertisements you'd see as a child, Smokey the Bear. Only you can prevent forest fires. That same thing could be said to us as believers. Only you can prevent a forest fire. Only you can prevent the spread of a malicious rumor or gossip. Think about how you use your words. Moving here to Kansas, I was a little uh, surprised, you might say, at the prairie fire. I'd see the fire department on the side of the road all the time and think, why, why is a fire truck just parked here on the side of the road? Back east, we don't really have these grass fires and prairie fires the way that we do here because it's a drier climate here and the high winds. It's amazing. Somebody can throw a cigarette out a window. And, and thousands of acres can be burned up just like that. You know that on su Sunday, uh, Sunday, July, or excuse, October the 8th, 1871, Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over the lantern and set, started the great Chicago fire, three, three and a half miles of city, 200 and or 17,000 uh, buildings burned and, and uh, 250 lives lost. And that great influence and impact all because of that fire. And yet James says the tongue is a fire. The tongue is unique in its ability to destroy and for destruction. And there's a lot of different sins we could talk about today, but you know, the sin of gossip, the sin of the tongue is, is especially prevalent and destructive. <laughs> I'm reminded of, of a man who, a group of men, <clears throat> excuse me this morning, uh, there was a uh, group of men, they were all gathered together, and they began to, to talk and they began to confess. And all these men were very influential in their community. <clears throat> it's Kansas allergy, so I'm going to blame it on that. All these men, they began to talk about various things they struggled with. And one man said, I am a kleptomaniac. I, I just have a desire to steal. I have an impulse to steal. When I see something that, that I want, I just, I just take it. And another man, he confessed and he said, well, he said, I, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. Many people don't know this. He said, but I keep a flask in my coat. He said, when things aren't going well, I just have to take a, a nip from that, that flask and to get through my day. He said, no, I know most people would never believe that about me. And another man, he said, well, I, I hate to admit this, but most people think I'm a family man, but I'm really a womanizer. And when I'm out of town, I, I just, you know, just, just constantly, uh, just, 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 I just have an eye for the, for the women. And uh, the fourth man was sitting there, and somebody said, well, so what, what do you struggle with? He said, I'd, I'd just really rather not tell you. He said, well, go, go ahead. We've all shared what, what we struggle with. Why, why won't you go ahead and tell us your vice? He said, well... I hate to tell you, but I'm a gossip. And he said, I just cannot wait to get out of here and tell about this meeting. <laughs> gossip, sin of the tongue, may be one of the most destructive kinds of sin that there is. You know, it's amazing. A lot of times we learn, we think about with gossip and lies, we can say these things, we can speak these things, and once we've said them, they're out of our control. Like a fire, it burns and burns without any stopping, any, any stop to it, any ability to get control over it once again. And we can ask for forgiveness, but once we've spoken those words, that they, they've been said, we can't take them back. We as learned as children to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. But we know that's a lie. We learn that and we say that as, as children to try to deal with the things that are said to us, but... You just allow a husband and a wife to get into an argument, and one of them says, I wish I'd never married you. You allow a parent to get so angry at a child that he or she says, I wish you'd never been born, and you're dealing with the scars that will be carried to the grave. Wounds from sticks and stones will heal much more quickly than the wounds of words. Whether those words are uttered to get someone audibly 
whether, whether or not they're inscribed on paper with ink or whether they're written on social media. James goes on to say that the tongue sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. How many fights have been started by words? How many murders by words? How many suicides could ultimately be traced back to words that were spoken? How many wars? No other member of our body wreaks so much havoc on human history than the tongue. Thank you very much, Ethan. Appreciate that. I, I might need this, and it is water in here. Okay. I've talked about that all. You know, if we think about the tongue, you realize that if we were to take a survey this morning to find out who is the meanest member in our church, you know who it would be? It would be the tongue. The meanest member of our physical body is the tongue. The meanest member in our church body is the tongue. And, and it is, he says it is set on fire the course of nature, the course of human history, and is set on fire by hell. The greatest weapon in Satan's arsenal is the tongue. And, and Satan used the tongue. He used words to introduce sin into the world. The Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 44, you are of your father, the devil, and you, the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. When he says here that the tongue sets on fire the course of nature, set on fire by hell, not only did Satan start the fire that is described as the tongue here, but it sets on fire the course of nature. I believe that maybe Billy Joel read this one time, and he got the idea for the song, We Didn't Start the Fire. I, I, by the way, I'm making that up. Don't go tell anybody that, but he read James 3. But, it, but, it, but the way that he describes it, this sounds much like what he's saying here. You know, we didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. And we can protest like that and say, oh, we didn't start the fire. Yes, it has been uh, burning since, since the world's been turning in the sense that when Satan introduced it into the world, it started. But guess what? We haven't done our part to stop the spread of the fire. We've contributed to it. We've offered it plenty of tinder and plenty of, of grass and plenty of things that it might burn. My father has some property in South Carolina that has been in our family for over 150 years. And when I was a kid, we'd be down there, my grandfather, he'd have a brush pile. And we'd get ready to burn a brush pile, and he'd always get the tractor, and he'd come around with a disc plow, and he'd, he'd plow a, a fire break around that brush pile. And the reason he'd plow that fire break is because you had all this grass, and once the brush pile started on fire, it would start to creep into the grass and it'd start to spread. But by plowing a fire break, he offered that fire something different. Rather than flammable grass, he would turn over that soil so that damp clay would be there and the fire would be met with something different, something that would not burn, and it would stop there at the fire break. In the same way, think about the way that gossip and rumors and lies are spread in the church, in a family, in a workplace. You've got to make a decision that you are going to be that fire break, that you will offer something different. Rather than giving it something flammable that can continue to burn and to spread, that you will stop and quell the anger and the spread of gossip. Let the buck stop with you. Hold your tongue. If your lips would keep from slips, five things to observe with care, to whom you speak, of whom you speak, and how, when, and where. The great impact of the tongue. And then look at the iniquity of the tongue in verse 6. He says, notice, that he says that the, the tongue is a world of iniquity. Now, iniquity just means wickedness or sin, and all the sin in the world can be summed up and spread through the power of the tongue. Think about its pollution. When he says it's a fire, a world of iniquity, it's so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. 
Jesus said it like this, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. James echoes this by saying that the tongue is uniquely positioned within our bodies that it defiles the entire person. Think of it like this. You tell a dirty joke, everybody thinks that you're perverted. You tell a racist joke and everybody thinks that your heart is filled with hate. And so our words pollute our lives like a broken sewer pipe. And maybe that's where we get the expression of potty mouth. A lot of people have a gutter mouth. Usually when we hear that phrase, we think that means they use a lot of profanity. And that's one of the ways that we can sin with our tongue. It's through profanity, unwholesome speech. But I believe even more serious is this sin of, of gossip, of lying, of flattery, these kind of falsehoods. One man said it like this. He said, you know what the difference between gossip and flattery is? Gossip is when you say something behind somebody's back that you'd never say to their face. Flattery is when you say something to their face you'd never say behind their back. And not only is there gossip and flattery, but lies shameless bragging speaking in a rage and and yet we have a tendency to minimize sins of the tongue the ninth commandment tells us we shouldn't bear false witness we shouldn't lie and yet we've changed that and we've twisted that to say something like this we we say well we tell a little white lies we stretch the truth we exaggerate yet proverbs 15 says that lying lips are an abomination to the lord and, and they're used in such a way that we can defile our entire lives. And so what should we do? We, and when we defile our lives, when we defile our mouths with our words, we must repent and ask God for forgiveness and cleansing and to go in a different direction. The iniquity of the tongue includes its pollution, but also notice the problem with the tongue. He says in verse 7, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile, of creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no one can tame the tongue. As powerful as the tongue is, it is incredibly hard to control. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God designed man to, to exercise dominion over creation. Man is the crown of creation. And we're to recognize that in some way that man, even after the fall, still being made in the image and the likeness of God, still retains a measure of control over creation. He said, David, I, I don't think that every kind of reptile, bird, and beast, and creature of the sea has been tamed by man. Uh, people still get attacked by wild animals, so yes, but guess what? Almost every kind of wild animal that's somewhere in the world is in a zoo or an aquarium and, and can be researched. And there is a way that humankind has been able to subdue the animal kingdom. And, uh, you know, whether there's this exercise dominion that we're to have over beasts. I made a horrible mistake yesterday, and I went and bought a dog for my kids that had been begging for one. And uh, about in the middle of the night, that dog started barking. And Laura began to ask me why I ever bought the dog. And I've already began to regret that. But, you know, there's going to have to be a, an attempt to exercise some, some dominion over that dog. But, but in the same way, we can exercise dominion over creation and over animals, but yet we can't seem to have any dominion over our tongues. That's the problem here is that we can see that the tongue has a great impact on our lives. There's great iniquity in our lives because of the tongue. And one of the other problems, the final problem he notes is the inconsistency of the tongue. In verses 9 to 12, he says, with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who've been made in the similitude of God. Oh, how inconsistently we use it. We sing glory to God on uh, Sunday morning, and then we go home and we gossip about men on Sunday afternoon. We bless God and we sing God's praises on Sunday morning at 1045. At 845 or 9 o'clock on Monday morning, we're using profanity about the other driver and the other car next to us at Russia. We're, we're using profanity against coworkers. And the question, he says, he says, if you look at that and you think about it, one person says to curse any person is to curse God's image in that individual. This is equal to cursing God. He looks at the natural world. James uses a lot of illustrations in this passage. And he says, can you get fresh water and salt water from the same spring? Some of you have lived on a well, lived on a farm, you've had wells. And uh, you go out there and you know that the water in that well is generally going to taste the same unless something happens to it. 
You're not going to go out one day and get fresh water out of that well and the next day go out there and have salt water in the well unless your well pump's broken. The problem is, he says, how can that be? How can it happen that you would get apples from a tree one day and oranges from it the next day? It doesn't. But our, our tongue is so inconsistent. It's not like a tree. It's not like a spring. And what's the problem? How do we have such inconsistencies coming from our mouth? The problem is we have divided hearts. But if our hearts are good, our speech should be good. And if our hearts are bad, our speech will be bad. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 12, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks a good man. Out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. I'm not telling you for just for, for one minute that you can never say something bad as a believer. But if your life is consistently defined by walking with Jesus, then you're going to consistently use encouraging speech. Let me say that again. I'm not saying that you can never sin in your speech as a believer. But if you consistently walk with the Lord, you'll consistently use uplifting, encouraging speech. There's a pattern there. That, and it doesn't mean that there's not going to be slips because we all have sin in our heart. And if you've been with Jesus, if you spend time with Jesus, it should be evident in the way that you talk and the way that you speak. In Acts chapter 4, we're told that Peter and John were seen by the Jewish leaders. And the Bible says it was obvious in the way they, and those who heard them, that they had been with Jesus. When people look at your life, is it obvious as they listen to what you say and by what you, what you don't say that you've been with Jesus? When James says no one can tame the tongue in verse 8, he's speaking of a man without God. But you and I have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I can never fully tame my tongue. The Holy Spirit can transform my tongue. It'll never be fully tamed, but it can be transformed. And I recognize it in my life, and I hope that you recognize it in your life as a believer, that we sin in many ways, and we all sin with our speech. And what do we do about that? The first thing is not to try to hide that, not to try to cover it up. Don't be worried if you have to come and, and, and pray at the altar. I'm not going to tell you how long the altar is and that your tongue is too long. Don't worry about that. We all need to admit that we need to put our tongue on the altar. We all need to say, God, I confess the sins of my speech. Lord, forgive me for that sin. And then I believe we need to pray not only for forgiveness for it, but I think we need to pray like David and say, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. If having, being perfect in speech was a requirement for being a preacher or a teacher or a Christian, nobody could be one. I'm thankful for that scene in the book of Isaiah in chapter 6 where Isaiah was standing there before the Lord. He stood in the temple and he saw the train of the Lord's robe filling the temple. And he said, woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And when he confessed his failure, the Bible says that the Lord spoke to an angel. He said, take a coal from the altar and touch his lips, cleanse him. And once Isaiah had been cleansed, once his mouth had been cleaned, not with soap, but with the forgiveness of the atoning work of the Lord, then Isaiah could say, here I am, Lord, send me. You can't say in your life, here I am, Lord, use me until you said, woe is me, I'm undone. And until the Lord cleanses you of your sin. I believe that when you'll come to that place where you'll ask for God's forgiveness, when you'll ask for God's strength, then you can begin to use your tongue to build others up 
rather than to break others down. You can use your mouth to share and to spread the gospel rather than it being a shame to the gospel. I want you to also recognize that if you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, if you've never asked him to forgive you of your sin, if you've never asked him to save you and come into your life and to sit upon the throne of your heart making the decisions in your life, there's no way that you'll ever overcome sins of speech because only through the power of Christ can our tongue be tamed. I want to invite you, if you've never done that, in just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. If you need to give your life to the Lord Jesus, I want to invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. For some of you, you may just want to kneel here privately in the altar. They're at your seat and say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins of speech. Help me to set a guard over my mouth and help me to go today and ask for forgiveness from some of the ones that I, people I've sinned against with my tongue. Father God, as we come to this time of invitation, we recognize that your Holy Spirit is in control and Lord, we invite him to examine our hearts and our lives and to show us what is lacking in the likeness that we are called to live in, to look like you. Lord, I pray that this morning, if there's anyone here who's not saved, that you would draw them to the place of salvation. Lord, if there's anyone here who needs to confess sin, I pray that you would allow them to be drawn to the place where they leave this place right with you and right with one another. Lord, may you do your work among us during this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.